Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode four of Eldritch Castle. You're still alive, at least for now. We'll see what happens in this new episode entitled In a Dark, Dark Corridor. I did want to say just a couple quick things at the beginning here. I just want to say that in the very near future, I'm going to be launching a new Kickstarter for a different D&D book of mine called Monstrous Heroes. Uh, it's something that I've been developing for a little while. The Kickstarter will be coming out very soon, so be on the lookout for announcements for that. But it is a book that allows you to create characters using non-humanoid races, monstrosities, elementals, there's a undead, there's all the non-humanoid races in there. Not only are they races, they are also classes. So you actually level up in that monster and get those different monster features for a bit. Then once you get ramped up to a certain point, if you want, you can go out of the monster and start taking character class levels. So I'll have a lot more announcements about that to come soon. I'm really stoked and excited about it. Okay, on to the episode. Good luck to you. Vlorgonthrix the Watchful has posed to you a riddle, a rather poetic and tricky one at that. This floating bronzen head claims to be a powerful guardian of the Great Hall, and unwavering in his loyalty to High Wizard Zadravno. He also claimed that he has not seen Zadravno leave since the last time he came home. And yet, your wizardly master does seem to you to be missing. Before tackling the riddle, you listen to your gut intuition. Is this guardian construct being forthright with you? What might have happened to Zadravno? This hovering metal cyclops head does seem to be dealing with you in a very straightforward manner. You sense nothing that causes you to doubt him. Though, given that he only watches over the Great Hall and the way to the entrance, it is likely that whatever has happened to Zdravno is contained elsewhere. Then the question of the riddle. If you can answer correctly and prove yourself to Vlorgenthrix, he will grant you permission to look around for your mentor. Some believe I am many a thing. Some believe I am nothing. I am a drop of rain inside the sun as it beams bright after the day is done. What might that be? Perhaps a rainbow? You take a long moment to think this over. You really don't know. You run through several potential answers. Rainbow, cloud, star. Well, could it be one of those? None of them fully make sense to you as you go through the mental deductions. Zdravno has shown you a book of classic riddles on a few occasions, and it is one of his favorite books. The riddle at hand does seem somewhat familiar to you. Yes, you did read this one before, but what was the answer? If you recall correctly, this is one of the many riddles crafted by the Labyrinth Lord of Bazagon. He is a mysterious archfey who creates wonders of artifice that many people claim are not possible. He accomplishes the impossible. That's it. Impossible is the answer. Some believe many things are impossible. Some believe nothing is impossible. It is impossible for a drop of rain to be inside the sun. It is impossible for the sun to beam brightly after the day is done. You could consult your divining cards and cast an augury, but that would take up some time, 
Plus, they're not exactly made for solving riddles. Rather, predicting good or bad fortune for certain courses of action. Feeling confident, you tell Vlorgenthrix that the riddle's answer is impossible. Oh, that is correct. How I hoped you would give the wrong answer. It's been such a long time since I have disintegrated someone. What? Before you have a chance to get clarification, the bronze head says, Now you may pass, but first receive this. Pursing his lips, Vlorgenthrix spits out a key. It lands, clanging near your feet, a sizable key made of copper. What door does this key unlock? I have rendered all the assistance I can for the time being. Consider yourself lucky that you are still standing. Oh, how I long to use the arcane ray my master imbued me with. Uncertain of whether or not to thank the floating head, you commence your exploration, starting here within the Great Hall. It is a large room, fit to host many people. There is a half-eaten meal on a nearby table. It's cold and clearly has been left out for quite some time. You peer into the open archway. Beyond is a dim corridor that has a doorway of its own. Nothing catches your eye or your ear in the corridor. Next, you take a look at the great double doors with the sculpted falcon head above them. They are heavy, strong, and have an iron door knocker in the form of a little monstrous face. A subtle sound catches your attention, and you put your ear to the door. Why, there are voices on the other side. You cannot make out what they are saying, as the sounds are too muffled. You ask Vlorgenthrix, who is beyond the double doors? I have seen no others enter the keep, only the master some days ago, and now you. I have heard no voices. Putting your ear again to the door, you listen intently. The voices have gone quiet. You insist to Vlorgenthrix that you had heard people talking in there. Throw open the doors and let's have them. I will reduce them to smoldering ash for intruding upon my master's throne room. At this, Lucia nervously darts under one of the tables to hide. You stand to the side and with a quick gesture and an arcane phrase, you chant the spell Mage Hand. A ghostly hand extends through the air, grasps the door's iron ring, and pulls. It does not open. The magical hand is rather limited in how much force it can exert. Perhaps the door is just too heavy. You shout for Vlorgenthrix not to attack until you have gotten out of the way. You grasp the iron ring for yourself. You pull, and the door does not open. You brace up and put all your strength into forcing it open. It still does not budge in the least. You ask Vlorgenthrix to open the doors. I am unable to leave my position, nor am I allowed to destroy my master's property unless it is to save his life. Can you elaborate on how else to reach the throne room? You test me with your nosiness, stranger. I have already stated that I have rendered unto you sufficient aid for the time being. If you continue to pester me and disrupt my watchful vigilance, I will blast you into smithereens! Not wanting to push the issue, you give up on the door to the throne room. You move over to the door on the eastern wall and give a look and listen there. Nothing catches your attention. It is a standard wooden door. You try the handle and it opens readily. You come into a kitchen filled with preparation tables, cabinets, pots, utensils, knives, a brick oven, stores of foodstuffs, and various other accoutrements befitting a noble cookery chamber. The room has an almost dungeon-like appearance, with chains and hooks hanging from the ceiling, and heavy iron bars over the window. 
a somber day outside produces a weak amount of light, only furthering the shadowy atmosphere of the kitchen. You take but one step in, and a putrid stink assaults your nose. On the nearest table, sitting in an iron pan, is a haunch of meat that has gone rancid. It must have been left out for a number of days to reach such spoilage. Perhaps the kitchen holds some clue, but other than the rancid meat, nothing immediately stands out. Not wanting to endure the stench, you head back to the entry chamber. You are interested in the two unique doors of this room. First, you go up to the stone door with the star shape cut into it. You notice that at the center of the star is a keyhole, a tiny slot right into the stone. Never before have you seen such a door. Curiosity prickles you from within. What could be on the other side of this door? You look it over and give a listen. Other than the door's fantastical appearance, nothing seems out of the ordinary. When you try the handle, it does not surprise you to find that the door is locked. You take the copper key in hand, but before even trying to insert it, you can tell it's not the right shape. It's too small. You put the key into the keyhole anyhow, just to confirm that indeed, it's not the right fit. It's not even close. You decide to spend some time searching the door over with close scrutiny for any fine details of note. The door really is quite unique. It looks built to be pushed inward, and you deduce that this is not a door that has been opened very often. You also suspect that it is sealed shut by more than just a mundane lock. Though you have already spent several minutes here, you really want to investigate further, as you sense there is something special about the star door. Producing your spell book, you turn to the section containing the spell, Detect Magic. You perform the spell as a ritual. This involves the repetition of chants and movements. These phrases slowly weave the magic together without the need for you to expend your own arcane energy. After 10 minutes, you have built enough momentum and the spell deploys. Your mind reaches out beyond the physical and you immediately sense the presence of magical effects. The stony door with the eight-pointed star emits a strong aura of abjuration. This means that some kind of protection or ward is over this door, and one of remarkable power. You consult your knowledge of wizardry to attempt to determine what exactly this ward is. You ascertain that the door is magically enhanced in two ways. It is fortified in order to be stronger and more resilient, and it is sealed shut. Whatever key this requires will be more than just a regular key. The copper key, though certainly unordinary, does not emit any kind of magic. From there you walk over to the iron door. Your detect magic senses nothing at this door. It is locked, and once more the copper key does not work. You give it a quick check. There is nothing to note here, not as far as you can tell. Other than the star door, the three light sources give off magical auras. The ever-burning braziers and the ever-burning sconce all have faint evocation magic, as you had already assumed. You wonder if you are missing anything here in the entry chamber. Without a doubt, you will need to come back here. Wanting to make use of the remaining minutes of your detect magic, you go back to the Great Hall. Lucia is still in hiding, and Vlorgenthrix levitates without end. As you move about the feast room, he subtly rotates as to always keep an eye on you. Other than the ever-burning sconces, the only magic here is Vlorgenthrix himself, and given the strength of the aura that he produces, you do not doubt his claims of being able to disintegrate interlopers. In an abundance of caution, you tell him that you are going to have a look farther into the castle, and you reiterate how you are very concerned about Zadravno, and that you are here to aid the master. 
Vlorgenthrix nods and watches you enter through the archway. The corridor beyond is a rather lengthy one and has a couple slight bends to it. Despite the magic torch fires, the shadows here are dark and pervasive. To your left is a typical looking door. You approach it, now within the final moments of your detect magic. Nothing about it strikes you, and it does not appear to have any locks. You have a look. It's hard to make out any details in this dim lighting. You don't think there is anything special about this door, but it's hard to tell. The door is unlocked, but as you go to open it, you become aware of a presence in the corridor. A figure composed of pure shadow glides up to you, its hands outstretched to grasp you. 